Okay, so today is lecture number 20. Exactly, we are at the half stage, 20. We'll have 20 more after mid -sem. So 40 lectures. Probably we won't have 20 because there will be some holidays, uh, institute holidays. So probably we'll get 19 maximum, but we'll see. Okay, so today it is lecture about Mercury, uh, first planet in our solar system if you're looking from the sun. So today uh, we are going to discuss about Mercury, the first planet in our solar system. And you might be getting the feeling that now we are getting into more exciting part of this course. So from now onwards, everything will be like one planet each so from Mercury up until Neptune, Uranus, Neptune will go. And from there we'll go to like these outer solar system objects, Ur's cloud, exoplanets and we just keep on going beyond that all right and then we'll also talk about theory of relativity and all that in future also after mid sem there will be two things happening one of course that uh, stargazing section which we discussed about and second thing i'll be circulating a google form with you all where you can suggest uh, uh, what you guys want to learn which i talked about in my first lecture i think so if something is there which is relevant to this course, which I'm not covering yet, uh, or which I am not planning to cover. And if there is time, I will cover it towards the end of the lecture, if we'll have time again. And pro probably some of it will always be there in some of the lectures, so I'll see. Okay, so you will have that opportunity after mid -sem. So for now, just focus on your mid -sem after this lecture, not before this lecture, because then you are going to miss some good information. Okay, so this is the image of Mercury. Looks very similar to Moon, right? Yes, so they look very similar. They're, they have similar kind of impact structures, similar kind of geological structures. So they are very similar. There is no doubt about it. Also, they, don't, they both don't have any kind of atmosphere. So that is what similarity is there. And this is only one face of Mercury. This is the link. Uh, I'll get the pointer. Okay, so all these features and everything are there. The only thing is the Mercury both faces, they look similar. On moon, far, near side is very different than far side, but that is not the case with Mercury. Mercury looks very similar on both sides. So entire planet looks very similar. Uh, this photo journal website is a very interesting website. The link I have put here for this image. But if you go to this website, you can find images of all kind of solar system bodies present there. So this is a photo journal maintained by NASA. So they put all the interesting images there. You can search by planet or anything you can search and you will find it. So it's a very exciting and interesting website. If you're interested, you can go there and check. So starting with overview, uh, Mercury was named after some Roman god, Mercurius. So all these planets are named after some gods in some mythology. So in uh, one culture, uh, in Hindu culture, they are called Buddh Grah. So Buddh is like one of the gods uh, in uh, Hindu mythology. In other mythologies, there are different gods. Okay, so lot of these are named after either Roman or Greek gods because at that time the research was going on a lot and these planets were being discovered. So at that time, people used these Roman gods or, Le or Greek gods to name these planets after. In uh, Hindu mythology also, there are different names and other mythologies I'm not aware of, but of course there are different names given to these planets according to respective mythologies. And it is called Mercurius and it was like god of commerce, messenger of gods, or mediator between gods and mortals, like humans and swiftest of the ancient gods. That means fastest among all the gods. And this name was given because the Mercury has all these properties. It is closest to sun. So people believe that it is uh, like a messenger between God and uh, humans. And also it is fastest anyways, because it is closest to sun. So the gravity is highest, so orbital velocity is highest. So that's why it is also swiftest. That's why it's named Mercurius. So a lot of mythology there. <coughs> it is smallest among all the terrestrial planets. So um, that means it is the smallest in our solar system among planets. Uh, Pluto is not a planet. 
So Pluto is a dwarf planet, all right? So its radius is only like 2439 kilometer, but of course it is larger than moon, which is only 1737 kilometer. These are radius, don't get confused, not diameter, okay? So this is uh, how it is. Surface covered with impact crater, as I mentioned, just like moon, and it does not have any atmosphere as such. Of course, it is different because it has many unique properties, which we'll see in a bit which when we learn about Mercury, that how it is also different from Moon. It axis is small, has the smallest tilt in our solar system. So for example, Earth has a tilt of about 23 and a half degrees. The Mars tilt is also 20, approximately same, around 25 degrees. So that tilt causes seasons, okay? But the Mercury is almost vertical and tilt is like point, uh, 1 by 30th of a degree. So it's a very small or non-existent. So it's like a, almost a vertical planet, not tilted through on that plane. But it has a very large orbital eccentricity. That means its orbit is highly elliptic. So that's why that ellipticity is like 0 0.2 there. Among planets, it is the highest. If you consider Pluto also, then Pluto has the highest. Okay, but Pluto, of course, is the dwarf planet. So among planets, uh, Mercury is, has the highest eccentricity. That means its orbit is most elliptical. Earth is like 0, 0.0 something, so it's, so it's almost circular. We'll see Mars also has a very high elliptical orbit we'll, when we get to the Mars lecture, but of course lower than this. So it is about 0.378, uh, 0.387 AU, AU you know, astronomical unit. So one AU is distance between Sun and Earth. So Mercury is of course closer, so that's why number is in fraction, 0.387. And it takes about 88 days to complete one orbit or one revolution around the sun. So its one year is only 88 days. Our uh, year is 365 days, right? So because of this eccentric egg-shaped orbit, it can go at close to as close as 47 million kilometer and as far as 70 million kilometers. And Earth is like 150 million kilometer, you remember? So it can go really far away from sun also, depending on the location of its trajectory. Okay, it is the second densest planet in our solar system after Earth. One interesting thing is it uh, rota it's rotates very slowly. So it takes about 59 days to complete one spin on its orbit. So Earth is like one day, Mars is like 24 hours, 40 minutes. So approximately one day, but uh, Mercury is very slow. It, it takes like 59 days to just complete one rotation. And we'll see some interesting things happening because of that in a bit, okay? So it has a very large metallic core of about 2,074 kilometers. So about 85% of planet radius is core only, all right? So that's why if you take the relative size between core and the planet, this has the biggest core in our solar system. Temperature, the same problem, just like moon. Day night, there is a significant difference. During daytime, it can go as high as plus 350 degrees Celsius. Yeah, uh, and sometimes even 430 degrees Celsius, as you can hear. And at night side, it can go as low as minus 180 degrees Celsius. So you can see how drastic that temperature difference is. But since there is no atmosphere, so there are no atmospheric waves we get to see on Mercury. That is the unfortunate part, but if you have such drastic differences, there will be a lot of atmospheric waves happening in the atmosphere also. Uh, like we learned about those atmospheric waves, right? Atmospheric dynamics lecture. So coming to some celestial mechanics stuff, which we learned in our second lecture, second celestial mechanics. So in celestial mechanics, what do we learn? Is that it is tidally locked with sun, but it has a three is to two spin uh, orbit locking. So now what is 3 is to 2? 1 is to 1 we learn uh, with Earth and Moon, there is always having the same face to each other, okay? But 3 is to 2 is little bit tricky. So why it is tricky? It means related to fixed stars. So if you are like uh, on top or you are measuring from like a fixed point of view, then what you see actually, you see that it rotates on its axis three times before it completes two revolution. So by the time it completes two complete revolution around the sun, it rotates three times on its axis. So that's what you see if you are like an observer from outside. So that's what fixed star means. 
fixed star means you are an observer who is stationary from on outside. Okay. Yes, yes. It's the math will tell you the same thing, but I'm telling you, like, even if you observe that, you don't know any math, you will see, like, the by the time it does two revolution, it will only spin three times on its axis. Later on, math will come. You start measuring, like, how many days it is taking, how much time it is taking. Then you can do the math also. But first, you observe, then the math comes. Yeah, yeah, it's the same thing. Yes, it's the ratio of that. Yes, I, I'll, I'll come to it. It's like an interesting thing, so I'll come back to it. I'm just giving you some facts before I get to it. So what happens if you are sitting on the sun, let's say, and you want to see from the perspective of sun, then what will happen? It rotates uh, with the orbital motion. It appears to rotate only once every two Mercurian years. So what does it mean? By the time it does two rotation, from sun, you will only see like it has rotated once because now you are on the sun. So from sun, when you are seeing the planets, this planet is going like this, okay? And since it is going like this, by the time it does two revolutions, you only get to see one spin because it will make three spins, of course, but what you will see, you will see like it has spun only once, right? Because from sun, you cannot count like how many times from like the frame of reference, it has only spun once. Rest is like just repeating the same pattern. So from Mercury, it's exactly opposite. You see one day every two Mercurian years. That means if you are sitting on Mercury, by the time you complete two years, two revolutions around the sun, only one day is passed as reference to Mercury. This three is to two is with reference to a person who is outside from an inertial frame, it's stable. But if you sit on the planet itself, it's a little different. Okay, it might be a little confusing. With an image, it will be more clear. So it has highest average orbital velocity, of course, because it is very close to the sun. So about 47.9 kilometers per second. Earth is only 29.79. You calculated this in the assignment also, around 29, 30 kilometers per second. And it varies from 59 to 39. Again, it will slow down. It will get further away. It becomes faster if it's too close because of the sun's gravity. So this is the image that will clear things for you. So it takes 176 Earth days, one Mercury day. So one Mercury year is 88. So that is like exactly half. So if you are like calculating the number of days, it will take 176 days <coughs> for one Mercury day to happen. Okay? And then one spin takes 59 days. So day is different, spin is different. Now you will be like, how they are different? On Earth, we don't feel it because we are doing this rotation every 24 hours. But on Mercury, it is very slow. So what happens if you look at these images, then it will be more clear. What is happening? How do you measure day? You measure day when from noon to noon, let's say. Okay, so that means the position of the sun is like the same in the sky on the next day. Only then you say you have completed a day from noon to noon. Let's, I'm just taking an example. So in the case of Mercury, it say, let's say it's day zero and you start at noon. It is rotating, it is also revolving. And now you have this dancing kind of thing going on. So what will happen? This is first year, okay? So by the time it is here, 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 it is rotating in 59 days, it completes one rotation. But because now, it has not completed the re entire revolution because it will take 88 days, okay? So now the, uh, the position of Mercury is different. So in this thing, you see, if this half, the whiter half, and then there is a gray half. Can you see? There is a brighter half towards the sun, then the gray half is there. When you start at noon. So the, if you keep the color composition same, then what will happen? The orientation of the planet is now different at the 59th day. So even though it has completed one spin, the day is not completed because now the orientation of the observer on the planet is different. And because the orientation is different, we don't call it, it has completed the day, although it has completed the entire spin. Okay, 
So that is what is happening here. So second year, what will happen? You keep on doing it. So by the time you reach the same position, now that same uh, observer will be on the night side now. So it will be like midnight. Okay. So that is what is happening here. Now the orientation is completely different. Even though you have completed one revolution, you, the, from the observer on the Mercury, now you are in the dark. So you are at the night time. So it's like a midnight now. So this is what is happening here. And on the third year when you complete everything, then the orientation gets just right. So that the same observer or same point is again facing the sun at the same orientation. And then you say the year, sorry, the day is completed. So it is, if you, uh, you are lucky that you are not on Mercury, otherwise calculating birthdays will be very difficult. Okay. So uh, yeah, we are lucky we are on Earth. Okay. Finding like who is adult, who is minor, it will be very tricky. That, oh, we are into the second year, but not into the third year. So it becomes tricky. Yeah. No, 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 that is different. So 18, 88 times two is 176. So this is measuring in terms of Earth days, okay? And 59 is two third of 88. Approximately, these numbers are approximate. Uh, these days are not exact. For Earth also, it is not exactly 365 days, one revolution. It is 360.25, that's why you have leap year, right? So these numbers are approximate, of course. These are not exact number. But just to give you an idea, so this is approximately two third. Okay? So if you multiply 59 by three, what will happen? 177 you will get. Right? Uh, yeah, so 177. So it's like 177 is like 176 days. Approximate numbers. And then you divide by two, you get like about 88 point something days. Because 176 is 88, half is 88. So numbers are approximate. Okay, so there is one long standing problem with Mercury. It was a problem, but it was eventually resolved. What was this problem? The problem is, as you get closer towards the sun, the planet's orbit starts to precess. There is a precision problem. Precision is like, for example, if you have like a, uh, I don't know if uh, in kids, when you were kids, you did something like that. So for example, if you have a stick and you put a circular thing on it and you spin it very fast, what happens? It spins around this stick, but it is not spinning in the same place. It goes like this, 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 right? So that is precision. Even though it is rotating about this stick, still it is going here and here. So, <coughs> so the image will give you a better idea. So the orbit dimensions remain same, but what happens? It goes like this, like this. So it is going like this, but it is like also go doing this. Okay? So Earth, uh, sorry, Mercury is moving around Sun, but also precision. So this keeps on happening. But this is more visible on Mercury because it is very close to Sun. And the problem is with using Newton's equation, it cannot be explained. So at that time, when people use Newton's equations with like gravity and everything, they could not explain the entire precision. The entire measured or observed precision was around 5,600 arc second. If you ask me what an arc second is, it's just one by 3,600 of a degree. So one degree, you divide by 60, you get arc minute. Divide by 60 more, you get arc second. Okay, just like hour seconds. Okay, so there is a 5,600 arc second precision happens on Mercury. Now, if you use the entire Newton's law, consider the gravity of all the planets, sun and whatnot, still there is a problem of 43 arc second because you get only five triple five seven using the calculations. But 43 arc seconds are still missing and that cannot be explained using Newton's law of gravity. And at that time, when Einstein gave a relativity theory, people did not believe him. People rejected his idea and they thought that precision is happening because there is another planetary body present just like Neptune. That's how Neptune was discovered, remember? So they thought that this precision is happening because there is another body present very close to sun which we cannot observe right now and that is causing this precision. 
but later on they could not find any planetary body big enough to cause this precision and the, the issue was not resolved at that time but later on using einstein's theory of relativity uh, that which says that space time is a fabric and it is bent by the gravitational force don't worry we will get to the theory of relativity in one lecture i'll explain all this in more details but the basic concept is the closer you get to a body the uh, time is uh, space time fabric is more bent so that bending causes more impact on the object which is closer to it and if it is further the impact is lesser of course so using this uh, theory of relativity the einstein calculated the perfectly uh, unexplained 43 arc second uh, precision in the mercury's orbit using the theory of relativity all right and once that was done using this general theory of relativity people saw that they could also explain the discrepancy in venus orbit of about 8.6 arc second which they could not explain using just newton's law of gravitation and that's how this theory became very popular that okay the theory of relativity is very important and when we get to the theory of relativity we'll see actually newton's laws of gravitations are just an approximation of general theory of relativity it's nothing different they are just approximations uh, in certain case when your speed is too low and your gravity is a bit low then the approximation works fine but once the gravity is too high and the speed of motion is very high then uh, normal theory of uh, gravitation fails and you have to apply theory of relativity and that's how this issue was resolved okay lot of talking so you guys see the table i'll get some rest okay i will not keep this awkward silence the thing is <laughs> uh okay so the thing is this is just a simple table just mentioning all the numbers i've just gave you so 1 au 0.37 87 au speed year and everything else okay so tilt is like obliquity is 0.5 23.5 approximately and as i was saying these numbers are approximate so these are more accurate numbers so like 87.969 and this is like 365.2 so though these numbers are more accurate so once you get to more accurate this is what we get okay okay so <coughs> so origin theory is very simple we learned about the formation of uh, solar system so similar theory is for mercury also the planet formed when the solar system was forming and since it is very close to sun ooh okay okay that was some dramatic effect you know you can believe i caused it yeah so that all of you are now awake okay the mercury is very happy uh you can hear me right this is working okay so the thing is mercury also formed just in a similar way like our solar system all right and since it was very close to sun or the center of the pl protoplanetary disk lot of volatiles and those kind of materials they went away and that is why it is more more refractory material left we learned about that the closer the planets are the more refractory materials you will see the volatile material you see in the outer part of the solar system because they could not sustain so much heat and all that uh so refractory compounds stayed and survive close to the proximity of sun and all <coughs> excuse me also interior of mercury was differentiating into a core mantle and very similar to the earth case now escape of atmosphere so it uh, where did the atmosphere go uh, mercury is not that small as as moon so at, there must be some atmosphere but it is not there so again we have to come up with some theory hypothesis okay so the hypothesis are few one of them is the energy of electrons and protons in this solar wind or is this young sun was too high and that swept away all the atmosphere of mercury they just took away everything okay <coughs> also the sun uh, energy was so high so you remember we talked about photochemical reactions right so at the top of the atmosphere high energy rays or high energy <coughs> radiation get absorbed by these particles and the the bonds break to break bonds you need very high energy right because these bonds are very strong 
and if you have lower energy they will just pass through without getting absorbed so high energy only can break this bond so sun uh, mercury is very close to the sun so these energy coming is very high okay so they can also bro break apart these molecules completely into the respective atoms and once they break into atoms they become very light so with the same speed they can escape very easily okay also mass of mercury is too small so escape velocity is only 4.3 kilometers per second of course earth is 11.2 so almost three times so that is the one of also the reasons the most of the atmosphere escaped okay and then there is a thing called impact hypothesis the same hypothesis which uh, uh, explains the formation of moon that there was an impact happened a lot of impacts happen during the early stages and they strip of this atmosphere with the mercury some part of mercury and that is also a reason okay this is not there you guys should have told me yeah okay came back okay good i thought i'm just speaking and you are guys like okay so this uh, speed uh, is slow and also the impacts as i was saying because of this impact this upper part was removed and that is why it has a very large uh, amount of core and less crust and mantle okay and but in case of mercury the material which was ejected could not combine together to form any moon so that material was spread across throughout the solar system or even beyond with these solar winds and other activities happening at that time so what happened afterwards so these are some features which are prominent only on mercury but not on other planets as such so after that the heavy bombardment and lava of this uh, uh, after uh, created after this bombardment filled the basins and locally covered the surface of the mercury this image can you see the craters they might look bulged up you have to train your eyes a little bit to see the depression the thing is once i'll upload this lecture if you want to practice uh, you can uh, put it on your laptop and imagine the light is coming from the right not from the left we have this uh, notion that we believe that light is coming from the left but light is actually coming from the right okay and that is why the left part is lit up but the right part of the crater is dark this is a crater this is region is dark because the light is hitting on this edge on the left hand side so you you if you keep looking at the image for some time few seconds and you just imagine okay light is hitting from the this side this side this side you will get with the practice you will see that it's actually a depression but yeah most of the times it looks like an bulge but it, these are craters believe me for now okay so this uh, volcanic rocks on the surface uh, are not been dated because we don't have any samples from there also the instruments which we sent or missions they just uh, orbited around we have, uh, have not have sent any landers yet so we have not studied them uh, in situ so we know that they formed around 4 to 3 billion years ago gas giga anum uh, similar to the analogy of volcanic rocks of moon so we have studied rocks of moon brought by these people from different missions so we studied those rocks and from using that we have guessed that mercury must have formed around the same time all right and this solidified uh, after initial bombardment and eventually it shrink and uh, the core compressed and mantle and crust uh, there was lot of faulting happened so you see this uh, red arrows they grow uh, they go across a fault this is not a crater boundary this is a fault how do we know it's a fault because next to it the elevation is different so there is a sudden change in elevation if the elevation changes gradually then it's a crater it goes down and then comes up but if there is sudden shift then it's a fracture okay it's not a crater so these are some differences there so observations it is too close to sun so very difficult to observe using telescopes or on ground stuff yes uh, we can utilize some satellites but again it is very tricky because the energy from the sun is too high and it saturates our equipment so we have to wait for certain times when it is at the dawn or the dusk time when it is just rising or the sun is just rising or setting at that time the intensity of sun is not that high and mercury is rising or setting so we can study mercury a better 
But 13 times in a century or every 100 years, 13 times, it happens that Mercury passes directly in front of the Sun. So it's, called, it's a phenomena called transit. It is used in detecting exoplanets also. We'll get to it later. But so when it is passing in front of Sun, then it becomes a very good opportunity to study Mercury. Why? Because when it is passing from it, we can use blockers for Sun and study Mercury right away. And that gives a lot of information because the sunlight are coming through the mercury, not through the, like the upper crust and it is like coming through the edges of the mercury. So we can study mercury in more detail, okay? Mariner 10 was the first spacecraft to visit mercury and imaged about 45% of the surface only, okay? And then messenger was like a mission dedicated to mercury itself. It orbited mercury over 4,000 times. Uh, for four years uh, and then it crashed onto the planets in around 2015 and in that period it measured the entire surface of the mercury and we have the entire map of the mercury available because of this mission messenger mission again this mission was sent by nasa and then there is one more mission uh, coming up isa and jaxa japanese and european agencies are coming together to send a mission in 2025, which will reach there. So probably it will come, probably not. If you are here, you can come back again to this class in 2025 and see what the update is. Or you can just Google. Okay, so talking about impact features, very similar to moon, but they are more uniformly distributed as compared to moon, okay? There are special features called scarps and roops these are basically nothing but crustal fractures along which there is a vertical displacement. So I just mentioned these vertical displacements are there present and these are unique to Mercury only. We, uh, there are no other planets or bodies in our solar system where we have such features. So uh, as I mentioned, the one of the reasons is because the shrinkage was happening very quickly and the core solidified very quickly, it caused this because of the shrinking, there was a lot of breaks happened. The fractures happen, right? If you like uh, dry something very quickly, what happens? You, the cracks appears, like ground. If you have a ground, like field, and if it dries up very quickly, what happens? You see cracks. So similarly, so these cracks appear on the surface of mercury. They are called scarps or roops in like literature, okay? So these are a special type of fault, not observed anywhere like moon, earth, anywhere, okay? It is preserved on Mercury because, again, absence of atmosphere, the, nothing can be eroded, nothing can be changed, so they will stay there for another billions of years, okay? So they have re remained there for like three billion years. That's what our prediction is. And they are going to stay there for until the Mercury is consumed by sun, remember? We discussed about that. That will be very, uh, like, interesting sight to see. Okay, so impact basins. So some of the basins I'm going to talk about. Uh, so Calories Basin is one of the largest, one of the largest, not largest. Will you remember? We discussed about the South Pole Atkin Basin for Moon last lecture. That is the largest. This is the second largest. Okay. Uh, this is around 1300 kilometers wide, so diameter. This is not Calories. This is uh, this Rembrandt Basin. It has a feature of wheel and a spoke. So if you look closely, it looks like spokes or spikes coming out from the center. Again, very unique to Mercury. And you have like a wheel uh, for the crater itself. And again, it was uh, a picture taken by messenger. Okay. And after the impact, the basin was flooded by lava. <coughs> so this is calories basin. So here you see this orange color and blue or bluish color, right? So orange color is because of the lava uh, flooding happened after the impact. So once you have impact, you remember, it gets all melted and you have all the lava coming out. So this la melted molten lava, it just fills up the entire crater eventually and then it solidifies. But uh, because the bombardment was continuous, so after some time when it solidified and cooled down, so uh, when I say sometimes, it means millions of years in this geological context, not few years. So don't get confused there. So after sometimes few hundred thousand something, when it is solidified, more impacts happen. And once more impact happen, they bring this uh, deeper layer to the surface, which is darker. So low albedo material, blue in the mosaic. 
so these are these are like excavated material from beneath the surface beyond the lava okay so this is what we are seeing here orange white is high albedo blue is low albedo so regolith again on mercury also we have a similar regolith or soil on the surface form, uh, formation of forming due to these impacts containing these small uh, silicates and beads and rock fragments and similar but not as thick as moon okay because the composition is slightly different one more thing we don't have any mercurial meteorites on earth so we have martian meteorite lunar meteorites but not any mercury meteorites again how we can tell using the composition and isotopic uh, measurements one thing which was believed earlier was mercury doesn't have any volatiles but that was proven untrue or false when messenger did its observations and what kind of observations was that they measured some highly volatile species like h hydrogen and organics and including sodium sulfur potassium and chlorine are abundant but mostly in this permanently shadowed regions so you remember about permanently shadowed regions we discussed in on the moon lecture last time so similar regions are also present on mercury and they contain some of these volatiles which was mapped by this messenger mission uh, you can find more details on th in this paper if you are interested which talks about the chemical composition of mercury using messenger data so atmosphere as i mentioned there is no actual atmosphere but you remember when i showed that slide in that there were some percentages written and all that that is based on the exosphere so you can say that mercury has an exosphere directly there is no nothing in between the directly what we have is the exosphere so you remember exosphere is or anyways very thin or kind of non existent only few molecules per centimeter cube so you can imagine that mercury has this exosphere existing okay and this exosphere is Uh, contains all this oxygen sodium hydrogen helium mercury and you remember i showed that composition where oxygen was like 41% but actually it's not any oxygen it's like few molecules of oxygen okay atmospheric pressure is 10 power minus 12 atmospheres so on earth it is one atmosphere earth is always taken as reference or 1000 millibar so 1000 millibar is like one atmosphere in case you don't remember all this conversions you can go back to that lecture where i talked about all the units okay but again you don't have to memorize this uh, it is 10 power minus 9 millibar so the atmosphere is 10 power minus 12 times thinner than the atmosphere of earth at surface so absence of water carbon dioxide has limited scope of geological activity so no geological activity similar to moon and mariner 10 detected that these uh, sodium and potassium uh, they are coming from regolith also so how this atmosphere is formed because of this temperature differences on the day side it gets so hot that if you have some volatiles present in the regolith or the crust the what will happen they will evaporate they will sublimate okay and then they will become part of this exosphere so that's why this concentration is also highly varying if you are measuring on the day side or the night side so it can vary significantly uh water so initially it was believed that there is no water of course there is no liquid water present on mercury it is very generally a very hot planet most of the times and once uh, it rotates it gets sun from all the side so it is heated a lot so no liquid water is present but eventually people detected presence of water ice just as similar to uh moon in the permanently shadowed regions okay so even mercury has water ice only venus is that uh bad boy in the family who did not get anything so venus does not even have any kind of ice all the planets in our solar system has some kind of ice whether it is methane ice ammonia ice nitrogen ice whatever some form of solid frozen ice is present on all planets in our solar system even moons also but um, this uh, in, if you talk about planets venus is the only planet where you don't have any ice I, even if you include pluto pluto also has lot of ices and if you include moon then io is the only moon where you don't have any ice okay because it is a highly 
volcanic active uh, moon, so there is a lot of lava and sulfur happening. But still, there you will find some sulfur ice, uh, like frozen sulfur. You can call it ice, I don't know. But the thing is, there is some frozen material present. But Venus, no frozen such thing present. So, uh, okay, so a messenger find this new evidence that deposits are indeed water ice. Initially, it was believed that this could be native sulfur. Okay, because the sulfur also have this uh, effect on radar waves. So this was measured using radar equipment. So initially it was believed uh, it is native sulfur, but later on it was found that no, this is not sulfur using again the same spectroscopy techniques. You can tell which type of composition is there, okay. So permanently craters, these are also named after some people. Of course not me, my name doesn't sound that good. As you know, I have said many times. So uh, this is the image of these polar ices. On the left hand side, uh, the orange is all the permanently shadowed region and yellow is your presence of water ice. So on the right hand side, it's only the same image is there. It's just only showing the water ice, not the permanently shadowed region. So it's the same image. One is also showing permanently shadowed region. So left one showing the permanently shadowed regions. This one is showing only water ice. Okay, and higher the intensity means higher the quantity present. So now talking about internal structure. So mercury has a very unique or interesting, inter excuse me, mercury has a very unique and interesting internal structure as compared to other planets in our solar system. So here you see a crust, then rocky mantle, then you go solid anti-crust, okay then outer core and then solid inner core just like earth. So what is this anti-crust? Anti-crust is simply a layer where you have solid iron sulfide at the boundary between mantle and core. So it's not either iron or nickel, it's iron sulfide. Okay, so this anti-crust is made up of uh, this entire iron sulfide and that is why it is called anti-crust because it is neither crust nor core. So they just came up with this name, they called it anti-crust. Okay, it has nothing to do, it, is, it has no fight with the crust. Okay, and it is not eating up the crust also. It is just a layer called anti-crust. And it, this is unique to again Mercury. You won't find this in any other planets. One of the uh, common property of Mercury is very high bulk density, only lower than Earth. So Earth is 5.5, it is 5.4. So this is the diff one of another difference between moon and mercury. Moon's bulk density is very low, only 3.3 something. Okay, this is 5.4. So its bulk density is very high, just like similar to earth. Okay, iron core of mercury occupies about 42% of its volume. So almost nearly half of its volume is core. Okay, and uh, iron core of earth only makes 17% of the to our volume. So on Earth, it is only 17%. Core is very small as compared to the planet. But on Mercury, it is very big as compared to the planet, of course. Planet is itself small. Uh, it, again, this is explained by several alternative hypotheses. Like <coughs> one, I've already given this hypothesis. The sun eroded away the upper atmosphere and also these volatiles. Also, when the Mercury was forming, it was not this solid. It was all magma and liquid state. So the sun, when it was forming, could also erode away a lot of material from the surface also. And this impactor hypothesis, where an impact happened, just similar to Earth, and it took away a lot, lot of chunk of upper part of the material. And that's why it was only left with heavier uh, core. All right, so similar theories are there. So again, we don't have to get into too much of it, but you get the gist of it. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it did not form any moon at that time. For many reasons possible, again, there are similar hypotheses, but you get the idea, all right? Talking about magnetosphere, the magnetic field strength on Mercury is only 1% as compared to Earth. So Earth has a significantly strong magnetic field. On Mercury, it is uh, negligible again, but still 1% is present. So. The thing is, it is very weak, but the puzzle is what's driving it. Because it is believed that core is solidified, because it's a very small planet. 
So it must have cooled very quickly. But the thing is, again, we have to come up with some hypothesis that why there is some. So it is believed that the, uh, the core is still slightly warm. There is some energy still left and it is some part of it is still liquid. And that is causing this dynamo action. We learned about it, right? Remember? So the same phenomena is also happening there. And research, research, uh, a recent research happened in 2021, this paper, uh, this is a clickable link, if you're interested, you can go, estimated that Mercury's inner core is only about 500 to 600 kilometers, and then you have a stratified layer on top of it of about 880 to 500 kilometers, respectively, okay? So those two layers are present according to this latest research. So that's what they claim, that you have this solid core and then you have a relatively softer layer on top of it, okay? So now talking about geological activity. So to get the geological activity, we have this thing called S by V ratio. That means surface to volume ratio. That means you take the surface area and the volume of a planet or a body, you divide it, you will get a ratio. If this ratio is very large, what does it mean? It means the same volume is spread over a bigger area. So if you spread the same volume over a bigger area, what happens? You lose energy quickly. You lose energy faster, right? It's like when you have some hot object, what you try to do? You try to dis like spread it out, okay? And then it cools faster. So similar thing is also happening here. If your S by V ratio is higher, in this image you can see, left hand side is S by V ratio in logarithmic scale. And on the x-axis, you have radius in kilometers. So for case of Mars, Mercury, Moon, and Ceres, one of the asteroids, it is very, very high. So it, that's why it is assumed that their core is almost solidified. There is hardly any activity going on. So geological activity is limited or non-existent on these planets and bodies. In case of Venus and Earth, this is very low. So there is a boundary which is given, which is around minus 3.2, logarithmic, of course. So 10 power minus 3.2. So the, if you are below this boundary, then the planet will be in some kind of geological active state or that body will be in, will be having some geological activity going on, all right? Uh, but in case of Venus, we see this uh, on the surface and whatever presently we see, but presently Venus is dormant. We don't know why. There is no actual volcano happening on Venus right away, but uh, there are a lot of features we see on Venus where it is believed that uh, recent volcanism has happened. But when it is stopped, we don't know exactly because it is very difficult to observe Venus and go there. It is very hot planet, kind of a hot-headed guy. Nobody likes, likes to talk to, okay? So uh, we'll do some little calculation here. So first is your total mass. So MP is mass of the planet. So of course, we can write mass of the planet as mass of the core plus mass of its mantle. So in case of mercury, it's only core and mantle. If you have crust, you have to also include mass of the crust. But mercury, it's simpler. So core and planet. Now we are writing mass as density times volume in the second equation, you can see. So density times volume equals to same. density times volume plus density times volume. Now this you divide this entire thing by net volume of the planet, Vp. That is the net volume of the planet. So on the left hand side, you are only left with density of the planet. On the right hand side, you have some ratios and multiplied. So that is one equation. Now there comes the equation number four, which is the last equation. What does it say? It says if you add up all the volume, it should be equal to one, right? So that these are fractional volume, volume of core divided by the total volume. Then second is fractional mental volume. If you add these two fraction, it should be equal to one. On Clear? Volume of core plus volume of mental should be equal to the volume of planet, right? Otherwise, how it will make sense? So you, now you have two equations, equation number three and equation number four. You utilize equation number four, put it in equation number three. Once you do that, you get rid of Vp, sorry, Vm. So we get of mental volume here, okay? And once you just rearrange this equation five, you get equation six in red colors, okay? So what does it tell you? It tells you the ratio of volume of core with respect to the volume of planet in terms of some densities. What are those densities? Density of the planet, density of the mental, 
and density of the core. Three terms, okay? Two are same. Don't say there are four. Two are same, dm, dm, okay? So for the case of Mercury, we know that planet's density is approximately 5.3. This is uncompressed density. So there are two types of density, if you remember, we discussed about that also. Uncompressed and compressed. Compressed means what is the current state? Uncompressed means if you uh, take out the pressure, for example, if you go to the core, if you take out the pressure, what will happen? The density will be lower because now you don't have that pressure, right? So as you go down, that pressure increases the density. So if you measure the uncompressed density, then you get this number. Uh, then dm is of course this, and then how do we know that? Using a combination of olivine and pyroxene uh, rocks, which are very prevalent in our mantle, and we are just using that analogy for mercury in this case. So this is the number we get, 3.34. And then for core, we are assuming 90% iron and 10% nickel, as seen in iron meteoroids. Okay, so we have some iron meteoroids. Using that composition, we are assuming the density of core or calculating it. And once you put all these numbers here, what you get? You get the size of the core about 42%. You remember I said that? The core uh, constitutes about 42% by volume. So this is a simple calculation which gives you the similar numbers. Again, these are not accurate calculations, but you remember we do these kind of calculations in this course so that we can understand and get close to what is happening. All right? So again, of course, if you want to calculate mental, then you just subtract it by one. So rest of it is mental. So about 57%. So that's how it is in case of mercury. So I think that's all from me for today. Be less curious about people and more curious about ideas. Because then you will progress. If you waste your time on people, you won't get anywhere. And a person you are wasting time on, they might get somewhere. Okay? So uh, spend more time on ideas. They will take you somewhere. Okay? So that's all for me today. All the best for your mid -sem exams. If you have any questions or queries, you can email me or come to my office. Thank you very much.